Good morning. Thank you all for joining us today. It is May 17th, the week of Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Week 2022. The theme this year is Bloodless Medicine and Surgery and Maternal and Child Health. This is a very special program with speakers and innovators in bloodless medicine globally sharing their knowledge and experience. My name is Cassandra Upchurch. I'm a registered nurse and I'll be one of the co-moderators for today. I would like to introduce our other co-moderator, Dr. Christopher Sim Utoi. Dr. Sim Utoi is a graduate from the University of Zambia with training in surgery and medicine, currently is functioning as a consultant surgeon managing all surgical conditions of employees and registered members of the mine hospitals. We're just going to preview the program today because there's so many great parts to look forward to. So for today, May 17th, um, you have myself and Dr. Christopher Simtoe as your co-moderators. The first speaking part will be by Dr. O'Conn on bloodless cesarean section techniques in low resource settings. And our keynote address will be done by Dr. Ari Shander, minimizing blood loss, a key pillar in bloodless surgery. And then we'll review bloodless medicine and surgery videos. I'd like to hand it over to you, Dr. Christopher Simtoe. Thank you very much, uh, initially. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome all to the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Week 2022, which is taking place from 16th May to 22nd May. The theme for this special week is Bloodless Medicine and Surgery in Maternal and Child Health. Special thanks goes to our speakers who have agreed and reserved time to be with us virtually and give presentations, and also the panelists who have also accepted to participate. I urge you all in attendance to take an active part as we all aim to improve the care of maternal health and child health in our communities. May we all have a good week. For now, for our first speaker on the bloodless cesarean section techniques in low resource setting, Dr. Okonokon is a fellow of the West African College of Surgeons and chief consultant obstetrician gynecologist in University of Calabar Teaching Hospital. He is the residence training coordinator for his department. He has been carrying out bloodless surgery in his specialty for more than eight years with excellent outcomes. He is a member of the local bloodless medicine and surgery group and several professional societies including the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Nigeria and the Bloodless Medicine of Surgery, Blood Medicine and Surgery Society. Again, the topic, bloodless cesarean section techniques in a low resource setting. Dr. Akon, you have our attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to first start off by saying a very big thank you to Dr. Michael Jones who handled the topic, bloodless cesarean section techniques. And he did a very nice job yesterday, he spoke extensively about all the techniques we use to ensure that we have a bloodless field and um, we avoid blood transfusions when doing cesarean sections. However, we will not be listening to the same uh, things all over again. We're going to use a slightly different, different approach in discussing this same idea of bloodless cesarean section techniques, but in a low resource setting, as uh, has been said. We're going to use a case presentation as a sounding board to explain what most of us do. Um, various definitions exist with respect to what bloodless surgery is in a low resource setting. So what is a low resource setting? That is where we're going to start from. Many definitions are out there about what a low resource setting is. Most people view it as a setting where the cost of healthcare cannot be afforded by the individual or the society. But a more comprehensive definition or understanding of what a low resource healthcare setting is, is when we look at it from the point of standards. This is a healthcare setting that does not meet the accepted standards of the World Health Organization or any other quasi-governmental organization. Such settings lack usually three basic necessities or three basic um, resources. 
The first one is usually infrastructure. Second is material and supplies. And the third one is human resources. So if any of these resources or structures is deficient in a healthcare setting, it becomes a low um, healthcare resource setting. And um, this accounts for why even in advanced countries, they can have low resource centers occurring in such areas. The main problem with low resource setting now in our environment is that um, many of the guidelines that operate in low resource settings are actually have been designed by practitioners or groups who have been operating in adequate or um, well-equipped centers such that when they bring those practice guidelines to low resource settings, they turn out to be poorly suited to those environments or may not be appropriate in such settings. So what can we do? Usually the challenges can be overcome if we look at um, the human resource in those centers. The human resource can help overcome those challenges that we meet in low resource settings because the ingenuity and resourcefulness of the human factor, especially their commitment and genuine interest, care and compassion for the patients can actually make a difference in these centers. So the answer to how we can still get good or near adequate care comes down to the human resource in these centers and how they can function despite the challenges or lack of equipment or materials. So let us start with the case presentation and then we can use it to highlight what I've been talking about. The first, the patient we'll be talking about is Mrs. EEJ. She's a 33 year old Gravida 1 para 0 plus 0. That is, she's never had any childbirth in the past. And this is her very first pregnancy. She saw her last menstrual period on the 13th of July, 2021. Her expected date of delivery was on the 20th of April, 2022. She booked at a gestational age of 14 weeks. At booking, she was requested to have an ultrasound scan done, but um, due to financial constraints, she could not have this done. However, about three weeks later, she was able to carry out the ultrasound scan. And the scan showed that she had an anterior low-lying placenta that occluded the cervical os completely. She was counseled about the findings and implications of these findings for her and her unborn baby. Interestingly, she is a Jehovah's Witness and um, she had on her a signed written document that um, prohibited any form of blood transfusion or blood products, even her own blood products. So with this in mind, we had to work out or modify her antenatal care plan we rescheduled her visits, changed them from um, four weekly visits to every two weeks. She, she was also placed on um, frequent hematinics. So she had to use iron supplements um, and other multivites with the aim of building up her red blood cell just in case she has any breakthrough bleeding. She was also giving treatments, intermittent prophylactic treatment every four weeks for malaria because the parasitemia associated with malaria could result in anemia. And if she has any form of bleeding, it will actually lead to a compromise in her health status and that of her baby. Following these changes, we then proceeded to monitor her blood level or her hematocrit. At booking, the hematocrit was 35%. Then at 22 weeks, it turned out to be um, 38%. At 26 weeks, it became 36%. So it rose and fell. Before she could have the next hematocrit done at 30, 30 weeks gestational age, she had a breakthrough bleeding, an episode of bleeding. For this bleeding, she was admitted in the hospital. The bleeding subsided that very day, but she was kept in hospital for one week to ensure that there were no further bleeding before she was subsequently discharged home. She was okay for two weeks, there was no problem. At the end of the second week, when she returned to the hospital to have a repeat ultrasound scan, 
she started bleeding again. So because of this second episode, which was much heavier than the first one, she was advised to stay on admission in the hospital. She was uh, readmitted. And this time around, we decided to keep her for five weeks because she bled at 32 weeks. We wanted to attain fetal maturity and see how we can build up her red blood cells. So she stayed on admission for another five weeks until fetal maturity was reached at 37 weeks and four days. At the end of this uh, period, she was counseled and um, offered the option of elective cesarean section, considering the fetus was already mature. And when we assessed her hemoglobin, it was 13.4 grams, which was a hematocrit of about 40% prior to surgery. The next slide here shows the um, ultrasound scan that was done. The P we see written on the side there is for the placenta. And then the IO we see is the internal O. So the placenta was sitting squarely, completely over the internal O's of the cervix, occluding it completely. When we told her about this after the repeat scan, we then um, proceeded to invite the consultant and anesthesiologist and another specialist obstetrician so that we could have capable hands during the surgery. The plan for anesthesia was to use a regional technique. And then intravenous access was secured while she was in theater. She was monitored routinely with non-invasive non blood pressure monitoring, heart rate monitoring, and um, oxygen saturation. The baseline values she had at the start of surgery was a blood pressure of 160 over 80. The pulse rate was 90 beats per minute and her oxygen saturation was 97%. Um, subsequently, we went on to have her surgery, but before then um, she had fluid. The anesthesia, like we said, that's the picture of the anesthesia when it was being administered by the consultant anesthesiologist. She had a combined spinal epidural anesthesia. So at surgery, we decided to preload her with 100 and, uh, 1,500 mils of uh, normal saline, which served to dilute the blood volume in circulation. During the surgery, her blood pressure remained normal, within normal range, and the surgery lasted about six minutes. Urine output was adequate, Oxygen saturation was adequate. Um, in total, at the end of the surgery, we had infused about 3,500 mils of normal saline. And when we eventually discharged her home on the fourth day post-op, her hemogram was 10.1 gram per deciliter. Post-operative care, which we instituted for her. Um, the next slide showed towards the end of the surgery, um, the surgical technique that Dr. Michael Jones described, the Joel Cohen incision. What we are trying, what I was trying to picture here was that even in cases where we are likely to encounter massive hemorrhage, the little things we do, meticulous hemostasis, preserving the blood vessels, not cutting them or transecting them, go a long way in helping us with reducing blood loss and avoiding blood transfusion. That's why I have this photo in there of the incision we made and while we were closing and just to show the vessels that were spared. Post-operatively, we gave her adequate antibiotic cover. She had adequate uterotonic agents administered so that she does not have any episode of bleeding within the first 24 hours in the post-operative period. She was also placed on hematinix to use for the next 90 days. Currently, she's on her sixth post six week postpartum and um, she's been compliant with her medications. So this case serves to illustrate a few things about the pillars of patient blood management. And what are those things that we are trying to illustrate with this case? The first pillar is to optimize red cell mass. The second pillar, which is to minimize blood loss and bleeding. And the third pillar, which is to harness and optimize the physiological reserve of the patient against anemia. 
So let's look at each one now in detail. For the first pillar, which is to opt optimize red cell mass, what did we do in the antenatal care period? We tried to detect anemia by checking her packed cell volume or hematocrit, looked at first possible underlying causes of anemia in this patient. We did her blood film for malaria parasite, provided intermittent positive treatment, intermittent uh, preventive therapy uh, treatment to prevent malaria, gave her hematinics to restore her iron stores, ensured that she took um, antihelminthes to kill off any intestinal parasites, encouraged her to improve on her diet so that she could um, supplement what we we're giving her orally. Intraoperatively, still to optimize red cell mass, we planned the time of surgery to coincide with uh, when the hematocrit level was optimal, hematological optimization. So our surgery was timed to coincide when we got a hematocrit of 40%. And then postoperatively, we continued giving her iron supplements to stimulate erythropoiesis and increase the red cell mass. For the second pillar, how did we implement this? The second pillar involves minimizing blood loss and bleeding. During the antenatal period, we tried to identify and manage all possible bleeding risk, which we saw in this case was placenta previa. So we increased the frequency of her visits. We did not have to take so much blood from her every two weeks to check her hematocrit, but we did that every four weeks. We discussed our plan of delivery with her, which involved surgery, and then informed all specialists, specialists who could help us or assist us in handling her case. And there's the option of autologous blood trans, uh, donation, saving, and then maybe later transfusing to the patient. But because she refused or declined this option, this was not done with this patient. Intraoperatively, what did we do? We were very meticulous with hemostasis. We made sure we preserved as much of the blood vessels we came across as possible. We also used hemostats in holding any bleeding vessels that we came across. And we gave hematology, uh, pharmacological agents that aided in reducing blood loss in these patients. We used tranexamic acid prior to the uterine incision. We also used um, oxytocin and um, egometrin, which were uterotonic agents that helped contract the uterus and reduce bleeding. Postoperatively, we also continued the uterotonic agents and monitored her for the next 24 hours so that we were very alert to any possibility of bleeding in these patients. We placed our adequate antibiotic cover that, that prevented any uh, infection, which could lead to sepsisemia and eventually anemia and possible um, hematological compromise in these patients. Then let us go to the third pillar. The third pillar, which is to harness and optimize the physiological reserve against anemia in this patient. In the antenatal period, we gave her hematinics. When she lost blood, we were very prompt in um, having her admitted, tried to assess the blood loss, did the hematocrit level to be able to determine what, has, what was the tolerable blood loss in this patient. And then, we were a bit restrictive in our uh, results to requesting blood for this patient. Although we knew, yes, she did not accept blood, we had to take extra precaution and uh, have her on admission for a whole one week. The bleeding subsided in, within 24 hours, but we didn't want to take chances of her going back home and having a recurrence of the bleeding. Intraoperatively, how did we implement the third pillar? of uh, patient blood management. The anesthetists were um, very helpful in this aspect. They monitored and optimized her cardiac output. They used um, an, an original anesthetic technique that uh, allowed the blood pressure to reduce, which reduced the chances of bleeding for us. And then they maintained adequate ventilation and oxygenation in this patient. During the surgery, she lost quite a, uh, an appreciable amount of blood but they were still 
restrictive in their requests for blood transfusion. They did not quickly jump and pressurize the patient that she should have a blood transfusion. And post-operatively, we were able to reduce her movement, observe her in the ward and in the hospital over four days. We were not in a rush to send her home and then uh, have her in a compromised condition. Interestingly, at the fourth, on the fourth post-operative day, when we checked her hemogram, it came to a value of 10.1 gram per deciliter, uh, comparable to a hematocrit of 30%. So in a poor or low resource setting, what um, can we do? What is the most important factor that helps us to cope and offer good uh, treatment to our patients? It comes down to the humans, the people involved. If we are committed, if we are willing and compassionate and ready to go the extra mile to apply ourselves diligently and meticulously take care of our patients, give attention to the small details, go the extra mile, we'll be able to accomplish great good for our patients and take care of them. We may not have all the materials and supplies that are required in a well-established um, center, but with the low resource setting and the low resources available, we can still give adequate care. So thank you. I think I had just 30 minutes. I don't know if I'm still within time. Hello? If anyone I... has any questions, you could put them in the chat. So we can ask Dr. Okan um, or any of our panelists to address any questions you have about this part at all or any topic related to what he discussed. Okay, I'm just gonna we'll go into Q and A. Okay. Uh, so one of the questions we have in the Q&A is, could you please review the medications? There were some acid you mentioned. Okay, yes. Um, because we did not have the option of cell salvage, um, auto transfusion and other things, we used a couple of medications to help us during the surgery. Prior to making the uterine incision, like uh, Dr. Michael Jones mentioned yesterday, we requested the anesthetist to give one gram of tranexamic acid. It's, uh, okay, someone has um, put up a question on it. We gave one gram of tranexamic acid prior to making our uterine incision. Also, we requested for 20 units of oxytocin infusion to be put up for the patient so that it will help with uterine contraction and reduction in blood loss. The whole idea was to use what we have with some modifications to reduce blood loss. Normally oxytocin is given after the uterine incision, but because we had the placenta sitting at our point of incision, we wanted the uterus to contract and give a living ligature-like effect to those blood vessels around there. The idea of giving tranexamic acid early was also to facilitate clotting so that once we have the vessels constricted by the contraction of the uterus, we could have um, the clotting process initiated early enough to reduce the blood loss. Eventually, we lost about 150 mils. We estimated 1,000 mils, but based on the hematocrit estimation, it shows that, yes, initial estimation is quite inaccurate. Um, what was soaked onto the drapes, onto the towels, uh, and into the suction bottles was underestimated. The post-operative assessment of 1,000 mils was grossly underestimated. But those are some of the things we did to help us reduce blood loss so that we could avoid a blood transfusion. 
Dr. Okan, we have a couple more questions. Um, one of the first questions is, are these drugs and assets readily available here in Nigeria? Um, interestingly, a couple of years ago, it was very difficult to assess some of these medications. But um, we spoke to a couple of pharmaceutical uh, stores around us in the neighborhood and within the vicinity. They are readily as, as, uh, available as long as you are willing to use them. The problem is um, they never stopped them because they had a time, a life, a shelf life. If they go beyond that shelf life, they expire. And the pharmacists actually incur losses. So they don't stock medications that are not often used. But if you decide to adopt minimal blood transfusion or bloodless surgery, you will end up using these medications very often, and that will encourage the pharmacists to stock them. They are available, they can be gotten, but you have to use them so that the pharmacists are encouraged to always buy them. They, they are not so happy when they incur losses, so they don't usually order for them, but they are readily available. Okay. We have another question. Um, if the blood level of a pregnant woman gets very low, how could she be managed without blood transfusion during delivery? Okay, um, that's a very interesting question. With the index patients, which I used to illustrate uh, what we did, um, when we admitted her, with the blood uh, hematocrit she had at about 34%, and considering it was, uh, type 4A placenta previa, major placenta previa. The guideline is to give blood transfusion prior to surgery. However, she was not uh, willing to have that. And she had a written document that uh, the durable power of attorney that prohibited us giving blood transfusion. So what we adopted was to keep her on admission for five weeks, give her oral hematinics, Ensure compliance. The problem is compliance. The main problem, if they take their medications routinely as, as prescribed, you'll find out that with the iron supplements, you expect the hematocrit to rise by 2 to 3% every week. And in this patient, in the index patients we had, her hematocrit rose, rose up by 2% every week. While she was on admission, um, from a, a hematocrit of about uh, 32 to 34%, we got about 40% prior to surgery. So there is a guideline that is out there, mild anemia, moderate anemia, severe amine anemia, that encourages blood transfusion late in the third trimester. However, with adequate care, proper counseling, and persuasion, you could get your patients to stay, build up their hematocrit level so that you avoid uh, transfusing blood. So if they're making progress towards delivery, you still have the time. You can actually build up the hematocrit. Nutritional supplements are also welcome because some find it difficult swallowing tablets. It's nauseating, the taste, they have diarrhea or constipation, as the case may be, you may encourage them to use the other nutritional supplements and improve on their diet. Green leafy vegetables. Um, some of me, like I'm here in Nigeria, uh, protein is rather very expensive these days, considering the economic situation. But they could take other vegetables, vegetable sources, non-animal sources for uh, iron supplementation, and they could build this up. Blood transfusion, in my opinion, should be the last result. If the woman is moderately to severely anemic and you anticipate a lot of bleeding, then as a last result. But it's, it's not always the case. If you actively manage the third stage of labor for delivery, you could actually control the blood loss and still have the woman delivered without transfusing. And then if you implement the third aspect of it, to optimize her physiological reserve, limit her movement, reduce the oxygen um, expenditure on her part, consumption. You can help her to be able to cope and then build up her uh, reserve and encourage her to occur. Um, 
As we uh, proceed and ask additional questions, I just want to invite uh, Dr. Yasoro to add any comments or any additional um, discussion around uh, this patient case. Dr. Yasoro, are you available? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you so much. Uh, please, uh, before I go on, um, there are some questions that were addressed to Dr. Kuhn. I think perhaps you missed them. There was a question about oxytocin, whether it can be used at a certain point during delivery. So please kindly check for that. And uh, I think a few other uh, things, uh, other questions. Um, so again, thank you for inviting me in. And uh, it is a very interesting case that Dr. Kwan has presented. And I thank him very much for this presentation. Uh, one thing he didn't mention is that at the very first bleed, he sent a consult to the bloodless surgery unit, which is actually the usual thing in my institution, uh, telling us that this patient declines blood transfusion and asking us to help manage um, this case. Why I'm mentioning it is to highlight an aspect of bloodless care, which is uh, the fact that it is multidisciplinary. So it's not a one-man show. Uh, if I'm handling my cases, I don't just handle them alone. I have to call in the hematologist, the anesthesiologist. He mentioned the, the anesthesiologist. And I think he, may, he might have called it the hematologist as well. So it's multidisciplinary. And when we came in, we were the ones that wrote down how we wanted the medication given. I want to emphasize the tranexamic acid. The World Health Organization has been asking us to use it, and it is widely available in low resource settings. So we, we ordered tranexamic acid, and in addition, we gave vitamin K. Uh, I think Dr. Kohn did mention that one because we are the ones that always write that one. Many people think of vitamin K in terms of um, in, increasing the clotting factors in the liver and it's going to take a long time to work. No, vitamin K has an acute action in any case of bleed. And the effectiveness of this tranexamic acid and vitamin K can be seen by the fact that the bleeding stopped promptly. It didn't stay like overnight, it stopped. Even when the patient had the second bleed, again, the bloodless surgery unit was invited and we did the same thing. And the bleeding stopped that day. In fact, they had gone to prepare theater and wheeled her to theater, but she was no longer bleeding. And we were the ones that suggested that, why don't we leave her further? Because that was, I think, uh, 32 weeks or so. So that was how she ended up waiting uh, that in, in the ward that we'll be watching her and if, if she bleeds again, we then intervene. But fortunately she stayed up to 37 weeks and the uh, fetus was mature. Again, we were invited to the uh, OR, um, which was quite appropriate. It's if, if a, a hospital has a bloodless surgery program, it is wise that those people should be there. It doesn't mean the surgeons don't know what to do or the people in the OR don't know what to do, but they can now concentrate on their surgery. So we are, we are the ones that would then be going between the surgeons and the anesthesiologists, and we determine when the tranexamic acid is given because the timing is important. And we, we first of all give, uh, somebody was asking a question that how do we give it? So we put 500 uh, milligrams intravenous as slow push. We say slow push because while tranexamic acid is a very safe drug, but it is known that if it is given very fast, it can cause hypotension. Uh -huh. So um, we give it slow push, 500 milligrams, and then we put another 500 in the infusion. And the idea is that if the surgery goes on beyond that infusion, we we'll still keep putting 500 milligrams in each infusion because the patient can take up to three grams. But in this case, I think she didn't need more than one gram. That's, that's how it works. 
um, the, uh, Dr. Cohn showed the anesthesia that was given. The anesthesiologist can tell us that, uh, you know, local anesthesia, regional anesthesia is better for blood conservation. So that was what they used and that was excellent. The, the patient bled a bit. I don't know, uh, yeah, the patient bled a bit. The reason for that, we think, is because there was a sort of um, confusion on, in, on the side of the person that was assigned to administer um, Dr. Kuhn, what was it? Was it egometrine after the birth? Yes. Oh. Um, the, there was a question here that I was waiting to answer, and that is how, where we had challenges. The, from Bright Chigu, he said, thank you so much for the presentation. The intraoperative blood loss was estimated at 1,000 mils. That means you think she may have bled significantly. What were the challenges securing hemostasis at the placental bed? And that is what you've just mentioned. After, after we gave the initial two medications, there was bleeding from the placental bed and we asked for egometrine injection. Right. Um, so that is where the confusion and delay occurred. Right. Now, why we asked, can I go ahead? Yes, yes, I'm just agreeing with you. Why we asked for egometrine? There's a difference in the mechanism of action of oxytocin compared to egometrine. Oxytocin will contract the body of the uterus, fundus and the body adequately give you good hemostasis from placental bed. But now the placenta is sitting on the lower uterine segment over the cervix. You have more fibrous tissue and less muscle fibers there. The advantage of ergometrine in this case is that it contracts that part of the uterus, reducing the amount of blood loss you are supposed to experience or you are likely to experience from that part of the uterus. So while the oxytocin contracted the body of the uterus, we had no problem there. The placental bed was where we had severe bleeding. So in the interim, while we were waiting, because they questioned our request or the decision to use ergometrine, we had to tamponade those vessels. We carried them up and applied pressure. But of course, because the blood flow is over 500 mils per minute, if there was if there was significant bleeding, but eventually the anesthetist, you know, saw through with the quick explanation, and once the ergometry was given, this contracted. It, it was just like suddenly, just it just stopped. Um, I wouldn't say magic, but that was what we expected. We didn't have yes. to go on in after putting on the line sutures trying to do interlocking or square sutures or trying the internal iliac arteries and all that. Um, the old reliable medications still work. So well. that was what accounted for that significant blood loss. If there had been compliance with the request, perhaps we wouldn't have had over a thousand mils. Yes, uh, please let me quickly defend the anesthesiologist, the consultant, uh, because I was on both sides. Okay. And, uh, what happened was that she asked whether it had been given and the answer was yes, you know? Uh, uh, so we left it. But when we noticed that there was still bleeding and bleeding, we had to ask again, was it given? And initially the answer was yes. And then, oh, sorry, no, uh, it's still here. So it was eventually given after the patient had experienced some significant uh, bleeding and it then stopped. So it's not as if the consultant didn't want to give, just that the assistant uh, gave a wrong information and said it was given when it had not been uh, given. And um, yeah, it, yeah, of course, in, in, uh, in bloodless surgery, we do not believe that any patient needs blood transfusion because if you say a patient needs blood transfusion, that means there are patients that need morbidity and mortality. And I don't think there's any patient who needs increased risk of morbidity and mortality. And no medical scientist can, I can defend blood transfusion. That is to say, look at how blood transfusion works. Nobody can defend it uh, because we know about the storage lesions, we know about the immune problems, and we know that in all settings, even in acutely bleeding patients, they, they are not 
going to benefit. There was an article just came out last month in Lancet and it's, uh, studying a scenario that we usually would think of transfusion, that is trauma with hemorrhage into shock. And it was comparing those transfused with those who were resuscitated with normal saline. And lo and behold, <laughs> they found that the transfusion arm didn't do any better. I guess they were trying to be sort of not too harsh. They would have said they did worse which is what most other people have found. So the patient's choice coincided with uh, modern medical science and also with our own position in, in bloodless surgery. So there is zero question of us trying to persuade the patient to take blood when we know that it would harm her. Uh, we, there's the, the results are obvious uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Cohn can bear us witness. We've been doing bloodless cesarean sections since 2007. And Dr. Cohn, have you lost any patients? Um, I've actually not lost any, and I don't right. hope to be any, actually. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. but, and the same thing goes for all other consultants, uh, obstetricians, because we work with all of them and one of them will be speaking tomorrow. Not a single person has lost one single patient in a low resource setting. That is not, and again, take note that Nigeria has one of the worst um, maternal mortality rates. So how is it that in a low resource setting in a place like Calabar, for so many years, not a single one has been lost and repeatedly we're doing, uh, we've been doing placenta previous, it's not the first case and other cases too. But one other thing is the, the recovery, which Dr. Cohn highlighted. Most, how, uh, how the, on average, how many days post-op do you discharge your bloodless CS patients? I'm sorry, I'm beginning to ask questions instead of answering. Um, three to four days, actually. But exactly so. Now, I, I, I most of them, but this one, we left out till the fourth day. Right. Now, I was initially very concerned about that and I, because I would have preferred they should stay for a week, the bloodless cases. But I noticed that they are com by first day post-op, they are up, breastfeeding their, uh, their babies. And when the obstetricians say, OK, you can go home, and I'm, I'm, my heart is in my mouth. But they go home, they don't come back. They only say, we are fine. So I, I don't stop the obstetricians anymore from discharging those patients uh, third, fourth day. That's how it is. So, uh, I, I'm sorry, it looks like I am with the picture that showed uh, how the wound was um, on the fourth day post-op when she was discharged. Oh, so okay. if, I, if I can, if we still have time, because the next talk is going to be in about 20 minutes, but I'll go off. Uh, the floor. If I'm able to, I will still uh, load it here so that you can see how the wound was after four days. Uh, you wouldn't believe that that was someone had surgery uh, four days prior. Uh, so she, she, uh, her latest hemoglobin, I can tell you that was 14.1. That was last week uh, because she comes to the bloodless unit for checkup. So her hemoglobin had risen from that 10.1 to 14. And of course, there's no guideline in the world now that would even ask you to transfuse a hemoglobin of 10.1. It wouldn't happen. Uh, um, even those who seriously believe that blood transfusion works, which we are not uh, such believers, uh, but it rose and it didn't rise on, the, we didn't even use intravenous iron or anything like that, just oral iron, diet, and uh, the adjuncts. So uh, let me stop there, please. Kindly look through uh, so, some of those questions that may have been mistakenly okay. uh, said to have been answered, but they were not. So we can answer um, the rest. Dr. Sarah, I wanted to bring you in so you can comment prior to texting the rest so you can participate too. So they're still here, okay? So one of the other questions that we have is, was the HOC involved? Great job in managing these patients. And if they were involved, uh, what was their role? 
um, the HLC were involved. Um, actually, that's why the durable power of attorney was brought up, you know. Um, they were involved and we're very familiar with the protocol. They actually provided moral support. Um, they knew the kind of protocols we followed and they were very supportive, both with information, both with uh, persuasion of the parent, patient to comply with most of the requests we made. They were involved. All, like he said, um, some things, some informations I skipped because I thought I had just 30 minutes to speak. So it was an abridged presentation. HLC was involved. The Goddess Medicine and Surgery Group were also involved. The hematologists were involved. The anesthetists were involved early on so that the consultant anesthesiologist was present during the surgery. Okay. And another question we have is, would you have managed her differently if the patient was not a witness? No. Um, I would have given her options. If she was not a witness, um, I believe the patients should have an input in their management. So would have given her the options. She could mix and match and take what she finds to be most suitable. But we would counsel the patients. Like in this index patient, the most important thing in patient management is counseling. You'll be surprised with the poor compliance you meet. No matter how, how much story you tell them, if you are not able to persuade your patients to toe your line, it is not by durance. You, you, you need to convince them and tell them why this is an, an, an advantage to them. And in this index patient, we were offering counseling every two weeks, even while she was on admission, repeatedly. And uh, eventually it paid off because she started complying. She followed everything we asked for and requested for. And it worked out smoothly. So counseling is important. So if it's not a weakness, with proper counseling explanations, she'll be able to choose the best options. And if she decides for no blood management, we will implement it. If she decides against it, we will still respect her wishes. If I may add, if I may add to that, so uh, there have been patients even in obstetrics gynae who are not witnesses. And sometimes they even had already grouped and crossed my blood, but they have, have the good fortune of being uh, cared for maybe by an anesthesiologist who is a member of the bloodless medicine and surgery group. Uh, I, I've had one of such experiences where the professor of anesthesiology member of the bloodless medicine and surgery group, actually counseled the patient and said, we can do this myomectomy. It wasn't myomectomy. We can do it without transfusion. Patient had already grouped and crossed much two units based on what the surgeon wanted. So um, she didn't, she wondered how it, that is possible because she had had previous myomectomy and had used four units of blood. But she said, no, we can do it. And then took it upon herself to go and talk with the surgeon who incidentally is also a member of the bloodless group. So they put their head together and they did the myomectomy. The blood wasn't used. And the patient was jumping with excitement because she was out of hospital within four days. Whereas she said the first time she was in hospital for two weeks. And so, but for my, to add again, for my own patients, whether Jehovah's Witness, non-Jehovah's Witness, I use exactly the same principles for everybody, because that's the meaning of justice in the oath that we take in the medical ethics. The first thing is patient autonomy, but somewhere there is justice. And therefore every patient deserves the good, good outcome that comes with bloodless. Okay, we have a few more questions. We're gonna to try to get them all answered. Um, so the next question is, uh, someone wants to clarify if the team used oxytocin prior to the cut to encourage placental blood vessel contraction? And if so, how did you balance the risk of bleeding with fetal well-being? Um, that's actually a very good question. Um, oxytocin normally is given as uh, um, an IV injection during cesarean section, a slow push injection. We actually had a modification of it because if you give it as an injection, it works within a few seconds, it's, it's already contracting the uterus. It makes delivery difficult. 
and you might have to use uh, forceps to aid delivery, compromising the fetal well-being. So what we had done with years of experience, with the experience we've gathered over time, is to ask for the oxytocin as an infusion. This dilutes it, gives you a lower dose of oxytocin coming into the uh, circulation of the patient, so that you find out that there is a little time interval. You have time to, manip to manipulate and deliver the fetus before the uterine contraction actually kicks in. So if you ask for it as an infusion, it gives you more time to eventually affect fetal delivery than when you have it as a bolus injection. So the compromise there is to have it as an infusion, which buys you time for manipulative delivery. Okay. The next question is, Regarding compliance, do you take in consideration the possibility of drug to drug, drug to food, drug to herb interactions that can affect bioavailability of oral iron? Could you have used parenteral iron in order to reduce LOHS? All options, well, first let's talk about interactions. Um, oral iron is what we have been using. You start it early, it's very cheap, it's very it's cost effective. Now. Um, herbs, he mentioned, you, you mentioned something about herbs, drug herb interaction. In this is Africa, people take herbs every day in their homes without consulting the doctors. There is usually the economic challenge that makes people resort to using herbal medic medications. Um, what we, we do is give the basic things that we are uh, familiar with over years that do not have a possibility of interaction. Oral iron separates, uh, B-complex as a separate uh, tablet, folic acid as a separate tablet. They're all very cheap. They have no interaction. In fact, they're all supplements. They're all like food supplements. Um, that is what we give. When patients decide to use herbal medications or nutritional um, dietary supplements like um, food or roots that they concoct and drink. If they tell us about it, we have been able to interact with those who prepare them and uh, found out that, yes, there are some safer options which are usually used in our local food or soups. They are eaten normally. But the problem is the food preparation process tends to uh, destroy all the micronutrients. So we tell them, okay, instead of taking your ugu, and cooking it for 10, 15 minutes and you lose everything, they are able to uh, blend it, um, squeeze out the juice, parboil it a little and take it directly. That, that way they, they maximize the benefits of the iron they get. It's a food uh, ingredient usually used for food preparation. They eat the leaves in their soups and still take their medications. There are no drug to drug interaction or uh, drug to herb interactions or adverse reactions with the food they take. So we only tell them, process it in such a way that you can derive the maximum benefit from it while taking the supplements. And now with respect to ion infusion, most people look at ion infusion to be equivalent to a blood transfusion. And a lot of people shy away from it. Blood is quite expensive in this environment um, because of the way it is procured. We don't have voluntary donors. Um, so when you tell them about parenteral ion, they immediately think of the financial implication, they shy away from it. So yes, we have used it for a couple of people, but you really have to talk and persuade them to accept parenteral ion. So for those who are open to it, we have used parenteral ion, we will continue to use it. But for the majority, prior to, before we get to that point where we have to use parenteral ion, we use oral iron. We try to prevent malaria infection. We try to clear intestinal worm infection infestations and try to optimize the patient. So we do all of that and we still use parenteral iron. But you, you have to actually convince people because there's a psyche and believe that, okay, this is more like a blood transfusion. Okay, another question we have is in case of compromised immune systems such as HIV AIDS that requires PEC cell blood, how do we manage the situation? 
Well, um, that's interesting. Um, most people, most of the clients or patients I've had who have been HIV positive, we actually anticipate or try and optimize them prior to delivery. I, I, I don't remember when last I, as yes, I actually ordered a blood transfusion, but um, it can be a challenge. So for most of them, what I would advise is anticipate the possibility of anemia, anticipate the challenges you may have and try and correct it. Um, like I say, success loves preparation or victory loves preparation. So if you prepare adequately, anticipate the challenges you may have, you could prepare your patients. And uh, we, we have pack cell volumes available in the hospital. Currently, the hematology departments can provide that. But with, I've not had the opportunity or the, any reason to use it for any of my patients so far. But I believe um, proper screening is done if it is to be given to a HIV patient who is anemic. And then considering that, yes, it's, it's a pooled uh, blood products from several donors, the risk is still very high that you may miss uh, contaminated blood. Probably maybe the donors were in the window period. So it's a challenge. It's, it's something that I would rather avoid than uh, have to resort to. Okay. And I'll also, uh, because the Q&A is also for um, Dr. Your, Dr. Khan himself and the other panelists, do any other panelists, do they actually want to add any experiences to uh, treating patients that are bloodless with compromised immune systems at all? Anybody have anything they would like to add? Uh, treating bloodless patients who are immunocompromised. It's basically the same principle as treating uh, someone who is, whose uh, immune system is okay. But uh, Dr. Shanda is here already and he is a captain of uh, Bloodless. He might shed some light on this. There's one, one attendee whose hand is up, uh, Kingsley and Nachina. If you have time, you can also call him to say something. Dr. Shanda, do you want to say something on that question? And if Dr. Parampala, yes, 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 can hear um, That's a very complex page, uh, question and clearly has to be individualized because immun immunocompromise is a, a basket uh, diagnosis. Um, so I think that, um, I think that uh, we have to look at each patient individually and see what their uh, immune um, deficit is, and then see if there's anything that can be done. I, I love that statement you made, uh, Dr. Ocon, that uh, success loves preparation. Uh, and again, I think that if we go take a step back and look at the, these different patients with their specific needs and try to address them as, as much as we can uh, prior to um, the insult of uh, surgical or any other um, uh, operating room or, or procedures that need to be done. It's very complex and um, it requires clearly the participation of the patient. Um, and, um, and again, being that uh, bloodless uh, medicine surgery is also multi-disciplinary, uh, really need to get everybody at the table. So there's no, um, there's no specific, um, specific therapy or intervention that I can uh, mention other than again, uh, individualize the care of patient who's got immune compromise. We talked about HIV. Uh, I think uh, with HIV, again, it all depends at the penetration of that disease because some people may just be positive uh, and are taking medications and are doing okay. And some patients may again have AIDS, which is uh, the full-blown portion of the disease. And they're clearly at, at very high risk. One needs to also understand that if patient is immunocompromised and taking medications, uh, whether they're suppressive medications or not, that they may interact with anesthetics too. So I think that uh, uh, the team needs to be aware of what the patient is taking, if anything, in preparation and understand that it may impact the recovery of the patient. 
Okay, we'll ask one last question. And for the panelists and Dr. Ocon, um, any questions that we were not able to get to will still be in the Q&A. So uh, you are welcome to just type your answer back to that person privately. Um, so one of the last questions we'll ask uh, live is, uh, the person says, thanks for your narrative. I'm really impressed, but I have a, a question. Do you make arrangements for blood before embarking on emergency C-section for non-witness patients? with major placenta previa? If no, what is the ethical justification? Um, for most of our patients uh, who come in as emergencies, the protocol is to request for blood. Basically, that's the protocol. We make, that is the routine protocol. That's the guideline. Request for blood, minimum of two units, four better before you embark on cesarean section. So there's no question about that. However, your skill or ability as a surgeon, the team you work with, those you surround yourself with, will be able to help you determine if you use the blood or not. For many of them, the request is made, but the blood is not utilized. For majority of our patients, for more, all the cases I've handled, um, apart from when I, my earlier years in starting, um, we've not resorted to any blood transfusion. We know the blood is there, it can be used, but we've, we've not had to call for it to be put up. So yes, it's, it's requested for everybody as an emergency. However, do we use it? No. Because when we're going in, we've assessed the patient, we put into place every measure that we're supposed to take and implement them. And we usually come out of surgery without having to use them. So there's no ethical dilemma or bias or imposition of my opinion or protocol on a patient who does not accept that protocol. Okay, so that is it for the live questions. But again, those questions will stay in Q&A for our panelists or our uh, previous speaker to answer those privately uh, in the chat. So they will type those answers back to you. Uh, we are gonna move on uh, to our next speaker is our keynote speaker. Um, so it is Dr. Ari Shander, who is a pioneer in bloodless medicine. He is the Department of Anesthesiology, Critical Care Medicine, Pain Management, and Hyperbaric Medicine at Inglewood Hospital and Medical Center in Inglewood, New Jersey. He's an adjunct clinical professor of anesthesiology, medicine, and surgery at the Gene School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, clinical professor of anesthesi anesthesiology at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School, and courtesy clinical professor, University of Florida of Medicine. Dr. Shander serves as Director of Education for Team Health, Anesthesia, and serves as a senior medical consultant to Acumen. He will speak on minimizing blood loss, a key pillar in bloodless surgery. Thank you, Dr. Shander. Cassandra, thank you so much for that uh, generous introduction. And I also wanna thank Nathaniel for uh, putting these uh, enormous symposia together on an annual basis. They're just uh, outstanding. And uh, we all tip our hat uh, to uh, the success of these. So uh, can you see my slide or is it, um, can you see my slide? Yes, yes we can. Okay, yeah. good, thank you. Uh, so in the next uh, uh, 40 minutes or so that we have left, um, my topic that was uh, rendered to me by uh, Nathaniel is minimizing blood loss, a key pillar in uh, bloodless uh, medicine and surgery. And uh, again, uh, you all recall the surgical pillars uh, for patient blood management, which include, again, the preparation of patients uh, by increasing uh, their red cell mass, minimizing blood loss. Um, again, we think of it in terms of the surgical blood loss, but you'll see that there's more to it than uh, uh, just surgery. And uh, third, of course, is su uh, supporting the patient uh, through, again, uh, treating and, again, making sure that the, the anemic patient is well comp is not compromised during the time that we're treating the anemia. 
And uh, the pillars for bloodless uh, surgery, uh, bloodless medicine and surgery, uh, as you could see, include the three pillars, but then uh, looking also at optimizing uh, tissue oxygenation, which may be part and parcel the issue of support of physiological intolerance of anemia. So uh, going back to the topic at hand, uh, you could see in terms of minimizing blood loss, uh, I've given you sort of an overview on the slide. And I think that it's always good to refresh our mind of what is uh, bloodless medicine and surgery. Again, I think that it's important for everyone to understand and I hear again from the previous uh, talks that uh, it's uh, some individuals who are not familiar with bloodless medicine and surgery think of it as a, a, a highly uh, unsafe or dangerous approach to patient. But again, I think it's important for us to reiterate that this is not a deadly approach, approach to care. And then moving on to preventing or minimizing blood loss. Again, uh, this is not a universal effort. Uh, we still have ways to go, not just in terms of bloodless medicine and surgery, but for the whole, um, uh, the whole situation in terms of healthcare across the globe. And then uh, look at some of the recommendations in terms of how, min how to minimize blood loss, uh, mostly during uh, surgical events. But as I mentioned, we can't restrict ourselves to the operating room because whether you're undergoing surgery or not, you're at risk of other uh, blood loss uh, through your hospitalization. And then looking at some specific in terms of effectiveness and then uh, a salary. So again, uh, we have to remind everybody the definition of bloodless medicine and surgery is to improve patient outcome with the use of clinical strategies for their medical and surgical care without the use of allogeneic blood products. We probably should change that to say blood components. But again, as you could see, the flag is up in terms of making this a multidisciplinary approach. We need to always think in terms of our colleagues uh, that are have a stake in terms of the recovery of the patient and getting the patient through safely. And they need to be at the table and they need to have, again, as we say, a vote, but the vote has to be a positive one, not just saying we can't do it. It has to do how do we do it and how do we do it safely with the best outcome for our patients. So again, uh, looking at some of um, uh, publications that we have, I, I, I put up uh, Nicole Gwynn's from uh, uh, Duke looking at the costs and outcomes after cardiac surgery in patients. Again, this is old terminology refusing. We like to call it declining transfusion compared with those who do not. This was a case match study. And I highlighted again that uh, this is not a large study. You could see 45 uh, patients uh, having cardiac surgery matched to two controls having same surgery. So one to two match uh, allows you to, um, again, do a what is considered to be a significant trial uh, with less uh, number of individuals within the experimental side or the, uh, the side that you want to look at in terms of outcome. And uh, you could see that the scores were the same in terms of comorbidity, but there was no significant difference in total cost uh, for witness and control. There was no difference in terms of ICU length of stay or total length of stay between the two groups. So again, it shows that with the effort of putting together uh, a program that allows you as a multidisciplinary program that allows you to get these patients, not just safely, that their outcome is at least equivalent, although we have some data which uh, shows that their outcome is actually better. Uh, but I think that we, we need to be careful in terms of, uh, uh, of that, but equivalent I think is just as good uh, as we can get at this point. And if we have better, it's just, uh, uh, it's an, an additional, um, uh, just uh, additional positive thing. So again, uh, they, they concluded that utilizing blood conservation measures, cardiac surgery would be performed with similar outcomes and cost versus control. So again, we're talking about conservation of blood, uh, patient's blood, which is important. Um, again, uh, this one was uh, published uh, in 2016. So this is uh, relatively 
a mature trial, uh, but this looks at the outcome of protocol-driven care, critically ill, severely anemic patients for whom blood transfusion is not an option. Again, this is the correct language, if you will. And again, you could see that there is a one to two and a half um, uh, ratio in terms of experimental versus the control. Uh, again, uh, transfused patients were slightly older, uh, had a higher hemoglobin level at admission. So that may have been actually a, uh, something that may have countered uh, the deficit in terms of age versus the increase in hemoglobin. It had slightly higher Apache score, but again, the Apache score is a range. So keep in mind, it's a measure of the patient's underlying uh, morbidity, but at the same time, you could see that you could have a higher score, but if you're still in the same category, uh, the score is there to predict, if you will, uh, for lack of a better word, your mortality uh, risks. So uh, the fact that you may have a score that's uh, 33 and somebody has a 38, uh, you're still within the same uh, mortality range. So it really doesn't matter in terms of uh, the score. We could just have said they were the same, but I think we have to be honest. Hospital mortality rates were 25% uh, in the bloodless patients and 25% in the transfuse. Again, so you could see the equivalence uh, is one where um, we really want to advertise, but uh, in the back of the mind, we always want to see if there's any better outcome in patients. And again, I think that that's just uh, added, uh, uh, as I mentioned already, that's uh, just an added positive thing. There were no significant differences in ICU readmission of positive blood culture results, meaning again, uh, looking at, at, at um, risk of infection. What I'm showing you in this is the low, uh, low hemoglobin uh, in between the two groups and the mortality rates. And you could see that this is, again, um, scored against the different levels of hemoglobin. And what's interesting to us was that uh, between 5.1 and 6 grams of hemoglobin, mortality was significantly higher in the bloodless versus the transfused population. And you wonder why, if you get below that, that there was no difference in terms of mortality between the two groups. And I will have to, again, uh, this is ad hoc analysis, which I'm not fond of, but if you look for a reason, we could uh, uh, very easily demonstrate that the majority of the patients in that group had uh, significant underlying malignancies and also were transferred from other hospitals where care was delayed for them. But otherwise you could see that there is no difference in terms of uh, mortality, except for that, uh, for, for that particular uh, hemoglobin, excuse me, level. Pollen is very high today. So uh, again, uh, bloodless medicine and surgery uh, in the OR uh, and beyond. And this is uh, the perspective, if you will, or, or perspective of the American, um, this is the uh, operating room nurses. And there actually we're addressing surgical techniques, but mostly patient education and also patient autonomy. So no matter what we're dealing with, we need to always remember that uh, not just the patients need education, but our colleagues need education too. When we're bringing a patient into the operating room arena where there's considerable uh, concern in terms of blood loss and recovery, but the patient's autonomy needs to be again, uh, constantly be reminded uh, for everyone. Another uh, publication uh, that came out in uh, uh, the American Journal of Hematology, this was a critical review, uh, treatment of individuals who cannot receive blood products for religious or other reasons. And this one, I think it came uh, mostly um, from uh, uh, some of the Hopkins people here, but here they were talking about vigilance. Now, uh, vigilance should be practiced in any surgical uh, situation, not just in the patients who are, blood, who are bloodless, but I think that maybe there should be a little higher vigilance in terms of intervention. Uh, but again, we believe strongly that every patient uh, should benefit from what we learn from bloodless medicine and surgery, not just uh, those individuals for whom transfusion is not an option. So here are some more data. 
Uh, this, uh, the first one you could see says Delphi approach uh, to the design of an uh, interdependent blood conservation pathway for open myomectomy. So again, going to the uh, GYN uh, population and again, looking at how we can conserve the patient's own blood. And uh, of course, you could see that uh, bloodless surgery in gynecologic uh, um, oncology, this also came out of the Englewood uh, group by uh, Namesh Nagarshev. And again, pointing out some of the steps that need to be done to conserve the patient's own blood and making sure again, that these patients get through surgery uh, with a successful outcome. And then uh, we had published, um, again, this, uh, this early on publication in 2003, uh, Surgery Without Blood, and again, bringing to uh, forward some of the uh, techniques that are required in terms of conserving blood for these patients for whom, again, transfusion or blood components are not an option. And one of the um, tables in this 2003 uh, publication uh, talks about the contribution of selected techniques to blood conservation and surgery. Now, keep in mind that for the reader, it's very, it's rather than us putting it in terms of ML of blood conserved, we decided to put this in terms of number of blood units that would not be needed if the patient did accept blood. But again, it's not uh, exactly the way we wanted to, but I think that makes it easy to read. So if you look at the different uh, preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative periods uh, for patients for whom uh, blood is not an option, if we look at the intraoperative approach, meticulous hemostasis and operative techniques, uh, as you could see, these are referenced, by the way, the ones in, in, um, in brackets, uh, at least one uh, unit of blood, which we're talking about somewhere again, uh, around the four to 450 ml of blood can be conserved. Uh, this can make a difference between a hemoglobin of say six and seven, uh, or you could put it in anywhere along the scale. Acute normovolemic hemodilution, depending on how it's performed, can reduce uh, the blood loss by two units of blood. So we're talking about now between 750 to as, as much as 850 ml of blood being sa saved. And interestingly, blood salvage or uh, cell recovery, uh, we could uh, certainly recover one and at times maybe even more depending on the amount of, um, of bleeding. Of interest here is the post-operative uh, approach to the surgical patient where restricted phlebotomy is, um, is mentioned. So again, I think uh, as you see from this particular table in 2003, we already had uh, data because of the references behind that some of these techniques clearly leave the patient with more blood circulating in their arteries and veins than uh, being thrown out uh, in the operating room if everything is applied. Now, each one of these alone uh, is not as effective of all of them being done together. Now, this table, uh, although it doesn't mention it, I would like to mention that this table is a product of work uh, that's uh, done by one of the most brilliant people I know, which is Zenon uh, Bodnarak, who put this together for us and uh, was instrumental actually in digging up some of the references to support this. So again, Zenon, thank you for this outstanding work. Now here's another uh, bloodless medicine, uh, what to do when you can't transfuse. Uh, again, uh, you can see this is in hematology in 2014, and they again uh, talk about uh, volume in terms of uh, uh, phlebotomy of patients, both uh, pre and post operatively, as well as the uh, other techniques that are already mentioned. And again, they did not quantify what you could do, but I just put the, um, the arrows there to, again, stress the fact that there are techniques that, that we could use. And those could, techniques clearly are not, and I think you, we need to stress this over and over again, these techniques are not restricted to bloodless medicine and surgery patients. Every patient can benefit from them. So uh, as mentioned here, you could see the issue of phlebotomy. 
And I think that that deserves a few moments in terms of addressing this particular uh, problem, which is pervasive across all medicine. So this is uh, data from a large uh, number of hospitals, 10 hospitals. Uh, you could see uh, close to 200,000 discharges. And uh, this is uh, from the Cleveland Clinic showing again, mild, moderate to severe anemia. And it's defined in terms of uh, hematocrits rather than hemoglobin, but you could do that math in your head. And you could see that uh, again, the prevalence of anemia is pretty high in patients coming into the hospital. And uh, the distribution of mild to severe anemia is also uh, pretty, uh, pretty high. Uh, mortality risk, as you could see, increases as your hemoglobin drops, length of stay uh, increases as your hemoglobin drops, and co costs of your care also increase as your hemoglobin drops. So we know that the hospital acquired anemia is, uh, it has a significant uh, impact on patients in terms of outcome. And our colleagues in Europe, uh, although this is all, this is from 2014, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. Uh, again, our, our Marcel Levy over here uh, writes that each 25 million liter of patient blood um, is thrown into the waste uh, containers, uh, sorry about the, the, uh, um, the color, uh, on an annual basis. So we're dealing with enormous amount of blood volume, which could be kept in the patient rather than uh, doing a test over and over again. Uh, taking you back to 1978, uh, this is uh, Rosenzweig's uh, uh, a quote, in today's medicine, bloodletting continues unabated. We have refined a technique called it lab work, uh, jab the patient incessantly, generate reams of questionable data. And he was right then, and uh, this continues to be in 2022. And bring you this data that was published by Lee and colleagues, looking at the uh, repeated blood uh, draws and the laboratory values as they relate to the care of the patient. And what happens here is that every day of the patient's repeated lab values, the significance of the information generated by laboratory uh, is decreased by 20%. So at day five, if you're doing the same lab values over and over again for five days at day five, the value is zero. Uh, however, uh, what you will find is that the amount of hemoglobin that you draw from the patient is significant enough to actually cause anemia, uh, which puts everyone, except for those who, again, decline transfusion, at risk of being transfused. There are two laboratory tests which are worth mentioning where their value is, is retained um, doing them over and over again uh, during the hospitalization. And one of them is, of course, a blood sugar for a diabetic patient to require control. And the other one is a potassium in someone who's developed acute kidney injury. Uh, we uh, <laughs> looked at this uh, just about uh, two years ago or less, uh, actually less than two years ago, over a year ago. Uh, this was a narrative review on hospital acquired anemia, keeping blood where it belongs. And again, we've shown that there was a significant number of uh, attempts, if you will, this is the uh, choosing um, wisely campaigns and recommendations from different organizations that deal with blood. And you could see again, that everyone frowns on phlebotomy. Uh, however, uh, the problem is that this behavior still continues unabated as already mentioned from the uh, quote I showed you before. And there's plenty of publications out there again to show that reduction of phlebotomy uh, improves the patient's own hemoglobin, if you will, by again, keeping the blood in their vessels rather than in the laboratory. So when we're looking at strategies to minimize intraoperative blood loss during major surgery, uh, this is uh, the British group uh, that had looked at this. And again, uh, you could see they're dividing uh, their, um, um, their second pillar uh, in terms of uh, minimizing blood loss and bleeding. So uh, to uh, Nathaniel's point, uh, here is a concentrated effort to try to identify uh, the, different, um, the different entities that we can actually employ to reduce, uh, blo minimize blood loss 
and hence put the patient at less of a risk and improve their patient uh, outcome. Uh, the strategies to minimize intraoperative blood loss is listed on this table, and you can see they're divided into organizational, surgical, anesthetic, and hemostatic. And I think to their credit, they really address everything in terms of uh, those different categories that I just mentioned. Um, but these are not always employed, number one, and two, when they're employed, uh, there may not be good understanding, which I will address with you as we progress uh, on this talk. Cell recovery, uh, as you all know, is a fairly simple um, procedure to do, but uh, even though I'm looking at the schematic diagram explaining what's being done, which I think is very simplistic, uh, I think that the issue of cell recovery is that it's not available everywhere. And the equipment itself is uh, not, uh, um, not uh, inexpensive. Uh, so there is a significant resource that's required to own those pieces of equipment. And in addition to that, the disposable pieces of this equipment may be, again, a hinder or a barrier uh, for many places in the world where resources are limited. So in the, in the face of not having cell recovery, I'm just bringing this up that uh, there may be other modalities, which I will address with you uh, shortly, uh, that may make cell recovery in some way um, inefficient, meaning that you're not going to get what you want out of cell recovery. If you have it, uh, clearly, as we mentioned already before, uh, every single uh, modality that is there to minimize blood loss uh, independently uh, can, can do that, as we showed in that table with the um, uh, loss of uh, units of blood. But all together, meaning if you use all of them in concerts, you're gonna get the most, uh, the better impact um, in terms of uh, minimizing blood loss. So um, as you could see, uh, this is uh, not reserved for, uh, for publications because from, uh, from our side of the world. Uh, here you could see uh, Nathaniel's uh, publication um, that uh, um, uh, talks about blood conservation and surgery, car and concept and practice. And lo and behold, here again, uh, the same table that was uh, shown in 2003 uh, is now again being used in 2011. And I think it's important because it drives the point over and over again that this is not just um, uh, doing things uh, without having some uh, impact in terms of true conservation that you can, and it's been again uh, addressed, as I mentioned in the literature, uh, that these are actually real savings and probably to, um, for many situations where there is a significant blood loss during the surgery, that these are probably conservative and may actually do better than what we're seeing. But again, uh, keep in mind that doing all of them, it gives you the best results. So Nathaniel, uh, thank you again for publishing this and resurrecting uh, this important uh, table from uh, Zenon. Now, um, topical hemostatic agents, uh, this is one showing you a publication that we had in annals of uh, surgery uh, in terms of uh, cardiothoracic surgery, where I think they're mostly employed, although we're starting to see them employed in uh, abdominal surgery and other, and other uh, specialty surgeries. Uh, the problem, of course, is uh, the question of how to use them, when to use them, and when each one of them is most effective. And I'm not going to go into detail because of time, but just to let you know that in this particular publication, uh, the attempt that we had, and as you can see, Art Bracey is the lead author here, is to first of all classify them in terms of their activities so that educating the clinician, the surgeon in terms of the use, directing them to the correct 
hemostatic agent rather than just using them arbitrarily because your hospital decided to just buy one. Uh, they don't work in all situations. So selecting the category is important and that's why we built the left side of the slide and then understanding where they're gonna be effective and how to use them under the circumstances is also important. That's the right side of the slide. Now, I know this takes a uh, um, front and, and a center stage right now, uh, the use of, um, of uh, hemostatic agents, specifically the, um, uh, the um, uh, antifibrinolytics such as tranexamic acid. Uh, I think again, uh, it, one has to keep in mind that anything that we, we use, it has to do with the fact that it has a benefit which is greater than the risk. However, if it's used indiscriminately, uh, the risk now can rise to the point where it may overshadow the benefit. And in this particular narrative review, uh, we looked at all of the large studies uh, that were done, including the crash, the women's study, and we did a critical reappraisal appraisal, sorry, of its use over the last decade. And again, I think that uh, one has to be very careful with the indiscriminate use that we currently have with tranexamic acid, because some individuals, and we really don't know how to identify them, that's the problem. So you need to look at the total clinical picture in a situation, are again, uh, the use, they're, they are, um, have a low fibrolytic activity or sometimes zero fibrolytic activity. And what happens when you give them an antifibrolytic, they become now at risk of significant thrombosis. So you may get them through the surgery and you may have less bleeding, but at the same time, the outcome uh, is gonna be overshadowed with the risk uh, that you may have introduced. So again, we're just warning uh, the, medical, uh, the medical community that uh, we need to find ways in which to identify those patients at risk where we will not be using some of these agents. And again, uh, just uh, this uh, late last year, uh, this was published in Tranexamic Acid and Obstetric Hemorrhage, uh, giving uh, empirically or selectively, with again, the same idea that one has to be cautious uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of using antifibrillatics. Now, I'm not gonna address uh, the, uh, uh, this concept of um, uh, fibrillatic shutdown, I think that that's a very controversial concept. So uh, this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about the phenotype of patients, again, who do not need antifibrillatic. Again, um, this is uh, uh, another publication looking at reducing red cell transfusion in orthopedic and cardiac surgeries of antifibrillatics. So now we're looking at all of them, not just tranexamic acid. And again, uh, when you use them according to this particular analysis, and this was a very large analysis done, and you could see Robert Thurer is in there as well as uh, Erwin Gross, um, we came up with the assumption, again, uh, as you always know, when you do meta-analyses, it's an assumption that it favors, um, again, the use of antifibrillinics in terms of reducing blood loss and hence reducing a transfusion. So this brings us to acute nomovolemic hemodilution. And in this particular uh, pie diagram, you could see that ANH really occupies a very small area in terms of blood conservation. ANH is a point of care blood conservation strategy, which is performed on the day of surgery. It's of course acute, so it's conducted relatively rapidly. It is normovolemic. That is extremely important to know because anemia and hypovolemia are a dangerous combination. So again, we have to preserve the patient's volume. Hemodilution is predicted response to the administration of acellular fluids, and it requires adequate vascular access. The process is the removal of patient's whole blood prior to the incision with a simultaneous uh, replacement of crystalloid and colloid to maintain euvolemia using monitors in the operating room. Blood volume is diluted until the target hemoglobin is reached. And again, we're inducing anemia. It's a surgical blood loss, uh, contains less. So when they bleed uh, uh, during surgery, they're bleeding less 
uh, red cell um, volume. And whole blood is returned at the completion of uh, the procedure where last is given first. And this is just a schematic of uh, the a &H, uh, procedure. As you can see, we remove the blood, we monitor the patient, we place them with, um, with a, a crystal or a color to dilute the, their red cells, and then, of course, return it back when it's done. So just to give you a basic principle, hemoglobin of 14 uh, with an estimated blood loss of 1,000 ml of uh, blood, uh, you're losing 140 grams of hemoglobin. Uh, again, if you dilute yourself down to hemoglobin of eight, you can see that the loss is significantly less, uh, just about half. Uh, so you're saving 60 grams of hemoglobin that's kept at the bedside uh, with the patient. And following surgery for critical um, or critical a moment, fresh autologous whole blood is returned. So again, it's the patient's own blood kept by their side. And again, it's a personalized blood bank, essentially. I'm not going to go through the history, but again, uh, the history of a &H, it really started with heart uh, surgery and trying to get extracorporeal circulation and the need again for um, restoring some of the blood that was being shed. As far as knowledge of what the target hemoglobin, even if you reduce the hemoglobin making the patient anemic, uh, remember that the critical point uh, at which uh, oxygen delivery affects oxygen utilization is in a human being is somewhere at a hemoglobin between four and a half and five grams per deciliter. So being at seven and eight uh, gives you still significant margin of safety when we do a &H. And that was actually shown by our colleague, um, uh, uh, Dick Weisskopf, uh, published again earlier in, uh, in the uh, 90s, looking at normal volemic anemia, a hemoglobin down from 13 to 5 grams per deciliter. A cardiac index, of course, rose, a heart rate rose, systemic vascular resistance dropped, as you'd expected. The VO2 remained the same. It may be even increased a bit, but it's really statistically no different, and there was no lactate issues. These were healthy volunteers. But again, in patients going for cardiac surgery, uh, looking at normal volemic anemia, an effect on cardiac work, and you could see that, again, there's a significant reduction in work of both the left and the right ventricle in terms of uh, surrogate measurements of uh, work activity of both ventricles are reduced with a &H, so it's protective. And another by Mark uh, Licker, lo looking at, again, uh, this, uh, this activity of a &H in patients undergoing valvular surgery. And you could see again, that not only it preserved blood, but also improved the, um, the blood profile by increasing erythropoietin. So again, the recovery is higher. And in, interestingly enough, also what we are seeing is that there's a reduction of um, tissue markers for cardiac injury associated with a &H. So it's protective in many ways. And here again, you could see the EPO levels are higher with the a &H group as compared to non a &H group. Again, uh, this was a meta-analysis and reduced the risk of infection. We don't know exactly the, if this is an association or causation and may be due to reduced transfusions, or it may also be due to the fact that that may have some protective effect. And again, uh, it's showing that there's a small but likely underpowered uh, the trials that have been used in the meta-analysis. So I think that the data that we have or conglomerate data that we have, a &H is a very effective way of not only conserving the patient's own blood, but in situations where you don't have cell recovery, by the way, the more blood you can actually take from the patient during a &H, it will make the cell recovery because it's so dilute, uh, ineffective. So again, if you recall, I mentioned that early on. There are many consensus guidelines out there uh, in terms of the using of a &H, uh, but uh, some of them are positive and others may not be supportive of a &H. But again, uh, we at uh, SABM produced the standards for best practice acute normal volemic hemodilution. This was uh, again in conjunction with NATA. And this is for cardiac surgery. 
And we've had uh, green, which is the clear indication, yellow, which again is recommendations too, uh, but they have to be done on an individual basis. And of course the red suggests that um, you should probably consider other modalities. And just to show you highlighted, uh, I bring these up so you can read them uh, much easier uh, than looking at them in the background of the slide. So the challenges remain despite longevity and theoretical benefits, safety and efficacy are still challenged. The efficacy challenged by some investigators never gained full acceptance is a problem. The severity of anemia at ranges of blood collections, again, uh, makes anesthesiologists uncomfortable. Uh, clinician experience, additional work, absence of reimbursement, again, is underutilized because it's small work, even though know it's better for patients may not be, again, utilized across the board. But for the bloodless medicine and surgery patients, I think this is not even a challenge. It's, it's, there's no option. So again, it's not a standalone procedure like anything else that we've discussed. A, a reduction of allogeneic transfusion requires a multimodal approach. AMH is an inexpensive, easily to perform technique that can contribute to patient blood management. So at the last moment uh, that I have, uh, minimizing blood loss extends beyond surgery. Uh, again, require a team of multidisciplinary approach. Many techniques and pharmaceuticals are available. The problem is some areas may have others or not. So you need to know the contribution of each one of those modalities to again, stratify whether you have the research or not, what you think is going to be the most effective in your particular area. Uh, one needs to be familiar and know when and how to use any of them. And each method has potential to save significant amount of blood, as we've shown. So pillar two is between pillar one and three. Remember, we always need to, again, employ everything uh, that we know in terms of bloodless medicine bloodless medicine and surgery. Uh, so again, we can provide the patient with the best outcome. And with that, I'll open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shander. So we also, before we get into the Q&A, and again, um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to put those questions in the Q&A box and we will ask them live. Um, we do also want to invite uh, Dr. Greg uh, Lobel, uh, who is a colleague of Dr. Shanders, who is the chief um, of the Department of Anesthesiology, Critical Care Medicine, and Hyperbaric Medicine, and Pain Management at Englewood Hospital. Um, so Dr. Lobel, are you on? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for inviting me. I, you know, it's, uh, you know, listening to... Uh, Dr. Shander's talk. I mean, uh, I joined Englewood 25 years ago. I came from an institution where I was not, did not receive any training in, in this. Uh, heard a lot of advertisement about a lot of what uh, he spoke about just now. And, uh, you know, after 25 years, I've, I've learned um, a lot. Had the opportunity to see live and, uh, you know, uh, in person, the benefits. Um, in addition to the literature that obviously has expanded over these last 25 years. Um, but as he said, there's, you know, it may seem overwhelming at first because there are so many areas that we can affect the need or the prevention of a need for potential uh, transfusion. Um, you know, he spoke mostly about intraop right now, but the pre-op, it's really a, a team effort. And having worked with Sherry Ozawa also for these 25 years, um, you know, had two of the greatest teachers, but it's a team and it's a constant uh, education that needs to happen. Even at any institution, once you think you have processes in place, new people join uh, at all different levels and uh, it's, it's a continuous process. But, um, you know, the benefits are, you know, as you know, I'm a big uh, believer in it. I think the literature supports it more and more each day. And uh, I think it's great to see such a large group, uh, you know, joining to hear about it and want to improve the care at their institutions. Thank you. 
So we'll go into uh, the Q&A um, and this will be addressed to our speakers and our panelists. Um, so Dr. Shander, um, one of the initial questions uh, directly to you is, please, uh, how do you identify patients with low or no fibrinolytic activity, especially in limited resource settings? I think uh, uh, like everything else, history is uh, the best way of identifying anything in medicine. And it's also a very good uh, indicator in terms of patients who've had any history of uh, thromboembolic or thrombotic events in the past. Whether they um, require therapy or not uh, clearly helps you. So if a patient did get, uh, say, uh, um, a course of an anticoagulant, whether it be warfarin or, 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 or similar, um, that puts them, I think, in many ways, at least in my mind, at a higher risk. It doesn't necessarily mean that they may have low um, uh, fibrolytic activity, but uh, it does suggest that. So one has to be uh, very concerned. The other, of course, in women, is a history may not have a thromboembolic disease, but um, if they have miscarriages, uh, it always alerts us also to the fact that they may have some phenotype. And um, in low resource situations, you have to rely on the history. And at that point, um, as I mentioned, we have a list of things that we could do in terms of blood conservation. You may want to take off from the list the antifibrolytic uh, for those patients who you may consider to be by history at risk. Okay. And another question directed to our panel. Do you think there will be more research and methods put in to address the functional iron deficiency, looking at ferritin, hepcidin levels of patients with high inflammation markers caused by cancer, age, infection, trauma, et cetera? Uh, if I understand the question correctly, is uh, the person is asking if there's going to be more research in trying to figure out how to diagnose the anemias or how to uh, address them? I wasn't sure. I how to address them. Um, yeah, I think that uh, we are constantly seeing publications uh, annually, uh, which, by the way, are increasing, looking at uh, the different uh, interventions for anemia. Uh, we're looking at uh, a different new um, uh, medicines that may actually inhibit, say, hepcidin. Uh, there are others that are looking at uh, HIF, 1-alpha uh, and beta, uh, again, rather than the old erythropoietin and ion therapy. So um, the, the quick answer is yes, there's a lot of research being done. And there are now products actually that are coming, will be coming and are coming into the market that are not a direct replenishment, but uh, will we'll work on uh, in inhibitors or um, uh, 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 blocking, blocking inhibitors, either one. So we're, we're clearly moving into a new era of management of anemia. Uh, it's still early. Uh, the, the issue is not whether there's research going on and whether these um, new modalities are going to enter the market. Our big issue right now is still that awareness of both the impact of anemia as well as the intervention that needs to be done even today with what the tools that we have is still pretty low and really needs to be, uh, the awareness needs to be increased as well as uh, on national and international ways uh, recognizing anemia as a pandemic that needs attention. And whether it's governments or insurers, they need to be again, woken up to recognize that this is clearly has a significant negative impact on the quality of life of individuals. Okay, and another question for our panelists. We performed a lot of a &H at the facility I worked at one issue we had was getting the volume back post-op, even with increase in diuresis. Any benefit to ultrafiltrate that, that volume for return versus using drugs to balance volume and pressure? Okay. I don't know if you have a comment. No, I mean, that's a, uh, you know, it is a challenge, obviously, whether or not, you know, how quickly does it all need to be given back also? I mean, that's always a question, you know, does it all need to be given back, you know, in the operating room or can it continue on into the recovery room? Um, you know, obviously safety comes number one, um, but, uh, 
you know, there's no uh, rush. We never did anything uh, like ultra filtration. Obviously, the benefits of uh, you know giving back the whole blood uh, at the end, you know, it has multiple benefits. So, as much as you know, it's it's a problem on the front end also when you're uh, removing the blood and maintaining euvolemia. It, it's a challenge, and we all have different types of monitors that we prefer to use to kind of indicate when we may or may not be euvolemic. But, um, you know, at the same time, unfortunately, some, I have found we have used ANH less frequently at Englewood than we did 20, 25 years ago when I first joined because the surgical techniques have just gotten so much better. Um, so we do try, try and weigh, you know, risk benefit. How much of a risk do we think there is of significant, uh, you know, blood loss? Um, and years ago that was probably higher and now it's less. So, you know, if it's a low likelihood of a uh, large amount of blood loss, we're less likely to use A&H in advance and probably use more self-salvage techniques as a kind of a backup, just in case we were incorrect. But yeah, there's no question. It's a, it, it's a challenge, but I think the most important thing is probably not the, no need to feel rushed. I don't think to return. Yeah, and again, ultrafiltration may not be available every place. So I think that uh, time, um, time will get rid of a lot of the fluid. And uh, again, you also limit it in the time that you could store the the blood outside the patient. So it, it becomes a balance. If you have ultrafiltration, it helps you get things done quicker. Uh, but uh, again, we've not had trouble in the past uh, returning uh, uh, anywhere to as high as four units of blood uh, to the patient. If you start that in the operating room and do it slowly, you'll be able to replenish the patient without ultrafiltration over time, uh, take the rest with the patient to recovery. So you could do another 25% or even as high as 50% in the recovery phase. But I would not send the patient to the floor with the blood. It's, uh, it's just too too many uh, too many issues, and uh, as you know, we're dealing with patients from blood is not a, a um, an option. And if they show up on a floor that is not a, as um, stringent and uh, well educated as the recovery room and the operating scene, uh, they may look like they're accepting blood, and that may confuse people on the floor. So again, we've made a big effort to make sure that. We try to give the blood back during uh, uh, the patient's stay in the operating room, but we'll continue to do it and complete it in the recovery phase. Okay, so the next question is directed at Dr. Shander, and it mentions uh, that you referenced critical, critical oxygen delivery of hemoglobin at uh, 4.5 to 5. Is it possible that a number can actually be lower? Um, and is that number chosen just to err on a side of caution? Is that why that level is chosen as a critical level? Well, that's a very good question. Um, no, I, I, I quoted the only, the only case in the literature that was uh, uh, published by Van Wark and it came, came, out, of, uh, came out of Europe. Uh, this uh, patient actually had fully, was fully monitored invasively. Uh, and had a very low hemoglobin. And uh, they were able to calculate the VO2, which is oxygen utilization, as compared to the DO2, which is the delivery of oxygen. And they showed that uh, the delivery, uh, when it reached around four and a half grams, and we use four to five because of the standard deviation, so we, with, just for the argument's sake, we'd say four and a half grams of, in that particular situation is where VO2 was affected, uh, a DO2 affected VO2, meaning the DO2 was reduced significantly and start affecting the VO2, which is oxygen utilization, showing what we call supply dependency. Supply dependency is when your tissues are not receiving, the cells and the tissues are not receiving sufficient oxygen for normal metabolism and become anaerobic. Now, anaerobic metabolism uh, gives you lactate. 
Uh, and keep in mind that there's nothing good or bad about anaerobic. Uh, we've learned over the years to um, look at anaerobic metabolism in a negative fashion, but it is part of the biology of, uh, uh, of the organism to be able to protect uh, cellular activity. Um, so to go back to the question, you know, could it be lower? Well, we don't have 50 or 100 patients to tell you that it could be lower. We only have this particular publication, and this is what we actually use uh, as a reference. Uh, so the answer could be that three and a half in some patients and two and a half in some patients would still have a DO2, which is not affecting VO2. So again, we know that anemia is extremely um, individualized, uh, including life-threatening or severe anemia, as we're talking with the, about these low hemoglobins. And hence, it's important to somehow uh, monitor these patients. So uh, keep in mind that if you reach the hemoglobin of around four and a half grams per deciliter or 45 grams per liter, you should start looking for any signs of uh, uh, supply dependency. Uh, uh, patients may be able to go down to, as I mentioned, two grams per deciliter without that, but you need to monitor them. So that's really the message. And it's only based on that particular uh, publication, which was a case report, but a very well conducted case report. Okay, so the next question for our panelists is, do you have any comments on the results of the resuscitation with pre-hospital blood products trial recently published in Lancet and the implication for trauma care? Well, uh, if uh, the question is coming from this individual as pertaining to the fact that they show no difference, uh, with a with a pre-hospital um, blood component use uh, in terms of uh, survival, uh, I think that that's pervasive. Uh, the, what we're seeing is that the trauma um, community is constantly looking for different ways to deal with blood components as the answer uh, to high mortality associated with trauma, and I think they're on they're on a clearly on the wrong course. Uh, we already know that blood components don't stop bleeding. And we already know that blood components don't reverse trauma. Uh, so I think that uh, looking for all of these different ways, whether it be whole blood now uh, versus the ratio driven uh, transfusion uh, protocols, these are all attempts at trying to again, use something that probably is never gonna give them the results. There have been previous uh, studies done uh, on, on um, pre-hospital plasma uh, that came out of the Midwest and um, uh, they showed there that uh, use of plasma, uh, I think it was even one unit or maybe one point something units of plasma improved survival significantly. And um, I, I just cannot uh, either biologically or physiologically explain uh, the effect of a single unit of plasma on trauma patients in a helicopter uh, improving their outcome. And since then, I think the enthusiasm has died because there have been so many questions in terms of how that trial was conducted. Uh, the Europeans, on the other hand, feel very strongly, and there have been publications, both editorial as well as opinion pieces, on uh, the pre-hospital use of blood components, and, uh, and that's what probably led to the Lancet article, showing again that there's no improvement in outcome. And we've had uh, two large studies done in the United States. Uh, one which showed absolutely no impact on survival, and the other one showed a small um, improvement in survival. Uh, when I say small, the number was significant in terms of reduction of mortality uh, in the pre-hospital intervention. However, uh, if you looked at the injury severity scores of those patients in that particular publication, um, they're still uh, both mortality as well as, uh, let me just back up a second. The, the injury severity scores were actually lower than some publications from Europe where their mortality 
even though they were not using pre-hospital, was a lot less than the mortality that was, again, uh, gleaned from that particular trial. So even though they had a reduction in mortality, they were still higher than the Europeans, who again did not use the same modality uh, for the same injury severity scores. Short answer, I don't think that this is a, um, a useful intervention. I think again, scoop and run, which is a principle today in terms of evacuation, get you to a center of, um, uh, of uh, uh, definitive care. And keep in mind that if you are bleeding as a secondary to trauma, uh, you're filling basically a, a bucket that has a hole in it. So the first thing to do is to plug the hole and then reassess your resuscitation. All these other modalities are just ways of trying to figure out how to use blood, which has been going on and on and on in a trauma population seeking some approval. So we have a vicious cycle of these trials that really have not shown to have improvement. Okay. So we want to invite any other panelists to add any additional comments if they need to. And um, I also wanted to invite Dr. John Friedman to, um, to join us and share any comments or experiences they may have on this topic at all. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. By the way, Cassandra, you're doing a terrific job. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, the next question is the presentation on TXA is more effective in minimizing blood loss or its effect if risky. Uh, if I have administered under prescription for both PPH and even after CS when, uh, when hemorrhage is severe? What was the question? Well, we, we're clearly, um, as I mentioned, uh, we, we really don't know um, how to identify those patients at risk who are gonna receive antifibrinolytic. Uh, the current dictum based upon the women's trial, and again, uh, keep in mind that there are enormous amount of shortcomings of that trial. And the concluding um, numbers are really questionable in many of our minds. Uh, it is still now uh, recommended across the, across the board. Um, I think that uh, if you're dealing with a postpartum hemorrhage, um, the, again, the risk of using tranexamic acid under those circumstances is pretty low, still pretty low. So I would still do it. Um, you know, if you've been hemorrhaging for quite a while and have not received tranexamic acid, uh, there is going to be question in terms of the mechanism of action of transcemic acid after someone is bleeding for a prolonged period of time. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it may help. But at the same time, I don't know that you can actually say that it will help. Um, but, you know, when someone is, uh, life is teetering, uh, you know, on the brink and uh, you want to use a rescue a drug as a rescue drug, I think that uh, tranexamic acid in someone who's been bleeding for quite a while would be sort of a rescue drug approach. I don't know that you're gonna get the effect, but certainly in an early uh, recognition of postpartum hemorrhage, I, I still would think that the risk outweighs, uh, is outweighed by the benefit. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Lobel, Sherry did uh, advise me how to pronounce your name, so I do apologize <laughs> for butchering your name earlier. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, so this question is directed to you, Dr. Lobel. Uh, from your comments, uh, I deduce that bloodless medicine and surgery has been in operation for more than 25 years. How come that awareness is more recent? Great, great question. <laughs> um, you know, I was on a, you know, not really that aware of it. Living in the New York metropolitan area, I'd heard ads about it even before I joined Englewood. Um, but you know, any any change in healthcare um, takes, you know, often takes a generation, unfortunately, uh, to to spread and to become part of the the norm, even if there is, you know, supportive uh, literature. So, I mean, this in the uh, United States and uh, the uh, we have two 
I think, founding uh, partners, uh, Dr. Shander and Sherry Ozawa of the Society for the Advancement of Patient Blood Management, um, it's album. And that was, I think, now just had its 20th anniversary, if I remember right, a few year, a year ago, maybe. So, you know, that was already an organization that was formed. So again, the idea behind it was even before that. So yeah, it's been around 25 years, but it we need everybody on this call to grab a friend and a friend of a friend and continue to uh, spread the spread the word, spread the literature, the science behind this. Wonderful. And I'll just make a very brief comment about attitude and compliments to you, Greg, because I think your very first day or first week at Englewood, <laughs> my husband was one of your first patients. Um, but you know, speaking to the many years now of um, effort someone like Dr. LaBelle has made in this, that, that even on his very first day, literally there's an, an open-mindedness to it. So that's still a key at 25 or now for Englewood, 28 years later, uh, clinicians that both have a, uh, you know, the right attitude towards certainly patients' rights and autonomy, but really also clinically curious, scientifically curious and open to a different way of doing things. Because now both with bloodless and PBM, we're, we're applying an evidence-based to an area where people really didn't very much, right? There was a lot of, as our, Dr. Shander says, eminence-based medicine, a lot of tradition, a lot of habit. And now we're saying to clinicians, not just for bloodless patients, but all around apply what is available, what data is available in the literature. And, and that's uncomfortable. So I think attitude is tremendous. Greg, you've been an example of that all these years and many on this call, but that open and curious mind um, is, is a key and, and that dedication to, again, the, the doing the right thing always for our patients. Yeah. Well, I think what you said is, is accurate. I mean, you know, we, when this started initially, it was for a subpopulation of patients. And then shortly thereafter, you know, as the benefits became more obvious on the evidence base, um, you know, why should we have two standards of care? One for who, you know, transfusion is not an option and another for who transfusion is an option. I mean, if it's better medicine, it's better medicine. It should be applied to everybody. Um, so although you get patients that come in and, you know, sign, you know, in our uh, area, you know, documentation to, you know, make a, I guess, a choice um, at the same time, you know, the same, we try and apply those same principles to everybody and, you know, we do transfuse patients. It does happen even at Englewood. Uh, and we still need to continue to monitor and try and, uh, you know, control it and continue to teach. And again, that open-mindedness is not always, uh, is easy to break things that we're taught in training. Okay, so, um... With Cassandra's permission, I think I have to give her a hand here until she's back because uh, she is off. I would like to see what questions she did not take. Oh, okay. There's a question from Jen Strickett. What about PBM, pre-hospital in ambulance to chopper, specifically collecting the blood loss, really the autologous before transfusions given? Many times we save allogenic blood in trauma, basically capture that blood and store until patients stabilize for return. So what do you think about that? I think that's to Dr. Shanda. Uh, yeah, first of all, there's something wrong with your audio, Nathaniel. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, no, no, I don't know what it is, but I'm getting sort of a very difficult to understand. So the question is, is what do I think about collecting uh, a trauma blood? Yes, it says, what about PBM pre-hospital in ambulance to chopper? Specifically collecting the blood loss, really the autologous before transfusion given. Mm. Many times we sell save allogenic blood in trauma basically capture that blood and store until patients stabilize for return. That's from James Trickett. I think he's in the blood salvage um, area. That, that's fine. Uh, you know, doing it in the helicopter is kind of uh, this, the logistics are, are kind of difficult, but if they can do it, uh, do it. Uh, you know, we have uh, published data now looking at uh, what we consider to be uh, non-sterile, uh, rather than the word contaminated, it's a really non-sterile blood 
uh, that is collected during uh, trauma. And uh, again, uh, these patients uh, need to go on uh, systemic antibiotics after the blood is washed and introduced, but also bacterial load. If you give it, um, if you look at the published data on bacterial load um, in, in uh, cell recovery is significantly reduced, again, reducing the risk of sepsis in these patients. And um, again, having the autologous blood available is great because if for whatever reason you can't match blood, if this patient accepts blood, uh, you, uh, you still have a head start. And for patients for whom blood is not an option, if there's blood that you can collect, do it. Because again, you'll wash it and uh, you can reinfuse it, put, making sure the patient is on, um, uh, on systemic antibiotics. The only time that uh, there is a relative contraindication in my mind or a concern is if the patient has a foreign implant. Um, uh, under those circumstances, uh, this may prove to be a uh, very long uh, or prolonged and complicated recovery for patients uh, if there is some kind of an implant, whether it be uh, orthopedic or whether it be a uh, valvular implant. So under those circumstances, you want to try to weigh what you're looking at in terms of the blood loss and whether you can, again, still get the patient through, a, through their course of uh, recovery without uh, collecting and reinfusing that blood. Thank you. Another question is, what methods sorry it looks like that question is gone um uh, let me see what happened to it nathaniel's here is what methods do oh, you welcome use? back <laughs> my computer's acting you out you have what very methods? big shoes big shoes you have i cannot step with them thank you nathaniel so is what methods do you use to judge the amount of fluids to determine whether a post-op patient is normal volemic? Um, a post-op patient? Yes. Um, you know, again, it's, uh, uh, there are ways of uh, non-invasive uh, dynamic measurements uh, to see if the patient uh, requires uh, more what we called, uh, for the lack of better word, although I don't, I'm not from that school of thought, uh, preload, uh, straight leg raising and looking at the, uh, at the pulse oximetry. Uh, there are other uh, dynamic measurements that can be done non-invasively. In the, in the area where you may not have the capability of a uh, dynamic measurement of uh, volume, uh, you know, postural changes are clearly uh, insufficient to do that. And again, I would just say that uh, under those circumstances, clinical judgment, meaning you could look at the eyes and nose, you could look at the, at the uh, urine output, and even at hemoglobin as a measure of concentration rather than just, uh, you know, whether uh, the hemoglobin is up or down. But if you know that you start off with a, with a, a hemoglobin, say, of, of eight postoperatively, and uh, now the, the hemoglobin is all of a sudden without any intervention is 11, you know your patient is pretty concentra concentrated and hypovolemic. Uh, those are all surrogate markers. I still believe that uh, dynamic measurements are still the best way to go if you have that equipment. And um, again, clinical judgment and looking possibly at other concentrations um, in your blood, such as hemoglobin, may be helpful. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously there's more and more technology that has come out. The PLEF variability index PVI is something that we've started to use more of. Um, but I agree, I mean, I's and O's are so important to have an estimate of blood loss uh, that's relatively accurate is extremely helpful and then trying to figure out you know is it is your you know does it go along with your hemoglobin that you're measuring post-op you know and try and judge whether that as aria was saying you know concentrated or not constant or diluted um so the measure of uh a, a, an accurate assessment of blood loss really helps to 
guide you as you that first 24 hours post up. For myself. This, okay. Next question is about PBM, pre-hospital or in the ambulance or uh, in flight, specifically collecting the blood loss, really the autologous before transfusion is given. Many times we sell save allogeneic blood and trauma, basically capture that blood and store until patient stable to return. So that was the question. Okay, so one of the, so, okay, so we have a question. Um, for a patient with anemia and pregnancy is normally quoted as somewhere between 105 to 120 dependent on trimester. Do you think that for a Jehovah's Witness patient, we should still be aiming for a much higher hemoglobin? 10.5 to, okay, to 12, okay. Should we be aiming for a much higher hemoglobin in pregnant women with anemia? Can anybody hear me? I think you might have uh, something in the background playing that's just interfering us with your audio. Oh, okay. Interfering with your audio right now. Something clinical. And what we're talking about in teams now. One second. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. That's much better. Okay. So uh, it's asking about anemia in pregnant women. Should we aim? But uh, normally, it's quoted between ten point five to twelve. Depending on a trimester for the hemoglobin, do you think that for a Jehovah's Witness patient, we should still be aiming for a much higher hemoglobin? My quick answer is that um, I, I'd like to have everyone the same. Uh, and uh, if we can get the uh, hemoglobin level of uh, a pregnant uh, bloodless patient to, uh, to 11 grams per deciliter, uh, I would be very happy with that. I, uh, I think that, that that's an achievement in itself. Now, um, pushing it higher, um, I would say that if there is abnormal placentation and there is a considerable risk in terms of a, a postpartum hemorrhage, the higher the better. Uh, but keep in mind again is that um, pregnancy is associated with uh, thrombotic events also. So you want to be very careful in terms of not uh, say going, you know, this is an arbitrary number. I'm going to say 13 grams per deciliter. But um, yeah, if there's high risk, I would like to see that higher. Uh, but in general, if I can get them to be 11, I'd be very happy. Okay, so the next question is, where would bloodless medicine be today without the challenges of Jehovah's Witnesses, religious beliefs against blood transfusions? Um, you know, it's, uh, it's such a hypothetical uh, question because I can't even think of the world without Jehovah's Witnesses. So um, uh, the, the, the quick answer is we wouldn't have uh, a bloodless medicine or surgery unless someone else for, for other beliefs uh, would be uh, raising, you know, raising the objection to uh, being transfused uh, by uh, used an old blood, so, so to speak, allogeneic blood. I think more importantly, uh, I would like to see the bloodless medicine and surgery uh, no longer be a quote unquote specialty or concept. I'd like it so that uh, the, and, and I think I've mentioned this uh, now more than two decades ago, that for me, the success of bloodless medicine and surgery is going to be its demise, meaning that any patient or any person for whom blood is not an option can get full and good and, and excellent care wherever they go, that there's no need for us to have specific areas and specific geographical areas, including different hospitals and different clinicians who provide this particular service that everyone 
would be providing the service um, and and in good ca- good care as well as everywhere, so that we don't need bloodless medicine and surgery anymore. That would be my my uh, uh, the way I would see this uh, as the success. Thank you, Dr. Shander. Any other panelists? Uh, what, what, would they like to comment? on that last question at all before we move forward. Cassandra, thank you so much for uh, running this. Did a great job. Thank you. And thank you all for, for speaking today and sharing with us. We greatly appreciate it. And we're gonna move forward uh, with um, some videos uh, and some of them are from um, some of our speakers today, some of our directors that have bloodless medicine programs. So we'll share some of those videos um, moving forward uh, with you all today on Zoom. So the first video we'll have is bloodless medicine and surgery, what you need to know with Dr. Stephen Frank. Providing bloodless care to patients is simply providing medical care without giving patients blood donated by another person. The way we do this is to conserve blood by reducing or eliminating bleeding by stimulating the body to make its own blood cells at an accelerated rate and also by recycling blood that patients lose during surgery and giving them back their own blood. Well, there are several reasons why patients may choose a bloodless approach to, uh, to their surgery. Uh, historically, patients uh, have elected to avoid transfusion because of religious reasons, uh, but also uh, some patients just simply wish to avoid the risk or the side effects of transfusion. For example, we know that uh, patients treated with the bloodless methods uh, have a shorter length of stay decreased incidence of hospital acquired infections and also uh, less chance of an allergic reaction or even receiving the wrong unit of blood which still occurs. The first thing we do is we diagnose or treat anemia prior to surgery so patients come to the operating room with enough red blood cells so they can tolerate any blood loss. During surgery We can avoid hypothermia or hypertension, both of which can increase bleeding. And then we can collect and recycle the blood they lose using the cell saver and give them back their own blood during surgery. We can also use what we call ANH, acute normal volemic hemodilution, which is where we bank the patient's own blood at the beginning of the case and give it back to them at the end of the case. There's one more technique. Uh, There's new versions of electrocautery that have come out recently that can dramatically decrease bleeding during orthopedic cases and during spine surgery, for example. Virtually 99% of all the procedures we do can be performed without transfusion. For example, we've done some really big surgeries like a Whipple for pancreatic cancer. We've done many of those without transfusions. Uh, We've done open heart surgeries, even revision open heart surgeries for valve replacements and bypass surgery without blood. Uh, And recently, we even did a six kilogram baby. That's about a 14 pound baby who had open heart surgery for tetralogy of Fallot uh, requiring cardiopulmonary bypass without a transfusion. We believe that we offer more different types of specialty care than any other hospital in the country that has a bloodless program. Plus, our program blends seamlessly into the care plan that's offered by all 
varieties of specialties within the hospital. Surgery itself is becoming less and less invasive. Uh, for example, the laparoscopic and robotic approach to different surgeries have dramatically decreased the amount of blood that patients lose and the amount of transfusions they require. Also, we're giving new intravenous uh, medications like iron, or we're even giving erythropoietin, which is one of the uh, medications that the professional cyclists use to blood dope, only now we're giving it legally to our patients to build their blood counts prior to surgery so they don't require a transfusion. We just want to invite our panelists to see if they have any comments or any thoughts they would like to share following that video. Okay, so we can go on to the next video, how it works, bloodless medicine and surgery, an alternative to blood transfusions, which is also a John Hopkins video. Every year in the U.S., patients receive 21 million blood transfusions. What if there was a better solution with significantly improved outcomes? So nearly every surgical procedure involves some degree of blood loss. And traditionally, we give patients blood from the blood bank. However, another option exists, which is called bloodless medicine and surgery, where we use alternatives to transfusion. Techniques performed before, during, and after surgery result in minimized blood loss, faster recovery, fewer infections, and quicker discharge. Bloodless medicine eliminates the need for blood transfusion, thus avoiding the dangers of allergic reaction, contamination, and the possibility of receiving the wrong blood type. Before surgery, medication and nutritional supplements increase hemoglobin levels, which help your body handle blood loss during surgery. A process called hemodilution temporarily replaces a portion of the patient's blood with fluids, lessening the impact of blood loss during surgery. Tools and techniques used during surgery include anesthesia processes to safely lower blood pressure. Harmonic scalpels clot the blood while cutting the tissue. Cell salvage machines collect lost blood, wash it, and return it to the patient. Hemoglobin monitors reduce the need to collect blood samples to be sent to the lab. After surgery, medications and techniques can minimize bleeding and improve oxygen in the blood. Often after surgery, Blood must be drawn to run follow-up testing in the lab. Microsampling requires one-tenth the amount of blood traditionally drawn, reducing the amount of blood patients lose by almost 90%. At Johns Hopkins, our team of highly trained experts have been providing patients alternatives and peace of mind for years. Okay, and we will just, uh, any questions or comments from any of, our, any of our panelists at all? Anything you would like to share? Okay, so we have time for one more video before we uh, re uh, recap or review uh, tomorrow's, um, tomorrow's speakers. 
and it's a Colin Smoke story, bloodless scoliosis surgery at Englewood Hospital. My name's Colin Smoke, and I'm in East Roudsburg, Pennsylvania. When Colin was born, we knew that he probably had hemophilia A, and we knew that it would be severe because of my family's history. My mom had eight children. Out of the eight children, three of the boys were found to have hemophilia A, which is a clotting disorder. One bled to death many years ago, and they didn't know what hemophilia was. The other two had received a clotting factor that was derived from whole blood, and they developed AIDS in the 80s, and they died from that. Even before I had Colin, I knew that there was a 50-50 chance that he would have hemophilia. But when he was two, he started to have bleeds. And the one bleed that finally put us into getting a port in his chest, he bit his tongue. And immediately that took me back to my older brother. He bit his tongue. When Colin was seven years old, he developed scoliosis. Normally they start looking for that at around sixth grade, but he was younger because I have scoliosis. So they put him in a, a brace and we actually thought the brace was working. It got worse. Then when we found out that it was progressing very rapidly, we need another opinion. We had that information for about two weeks and then he was diagnosed with type one diabetes. So the brace was actually getting smaller on him because of weight loss. And then he had a growth spurt and the scoliosis became much worse. If you see an x-ray of his curve, it's like looking underneath your kitchen sink. It goes like this and goes around and up like that. Everything was just so perfectly lined up to have everything that could possibly go wrong happen all at once. Within a few months, he was to the point where he needed surgery. We passed a lot of hospitals to go to Englewood Hospital um, because they, the majority of them don't have the bloodless medicine surgery departments. They don't have them. Or they have some form of them, but it falls apart at the end and they want to they give you blood anyway. His problems were several. Number one, he's a Jehovah's Witness, so he won't accept blood. On top of that, he's an insulin-dependent diabetic, and on top of that, uh, that really makes it uh, far more difficult as he has a severe case of hemophilia. The problem with these spine surgeries, these large scoliosis surgeries, is that they will lose blood during surgery. It comes with the territory. This was a little unique to several individuals here. It's not a routine case. But at the same time, we had a core group that preoperatively we met with and had everybody on board with what the plan was. When he was examining me, we talked about everything and he just said, no, mm, well, that's no problem. We'll, we'll work around that, it's no problem. The work that went through, the phone calls they made, and the way they made us feel just so comfortable, it was just, oh, you can't describe it. This case went so smoothly, we did it at one sitting. And there was not significant blood loss, and uh, all of his medical issues were handled perfectly. He, he didn't turn it here. He did beautifully. He was up and walking around, I believe post-op uh, day number one, and uh, was walking the halls of the intensive care unit. The one outstanding feature of the bloodless medicine program was that although it was initially developed to help Jehovah's Witness patients, the principles we learned now apply to everybody. It actually benefited all patients. As a nurse, the level of care that I saw there was exceptional. They just, everything they did is just unfathomable. I, I don't have words to describe 
He said within a year, Colin can do anything he wants to do. He could even play contact sports if he wanted to. His back would be that heel. So it's nice to know that he shouldn't have any limitations at all. It's only going to get better. I mean, if I'm better at this point, it's just going to keep getting better and better and better. From going from driving home from the one hospital and being so upset, and then driving home from that doctor's appointment, totally different. It was, oh, wow, we can get this done. It was worth it to go to Englewood, to go that hour and a half, and we would go further um, because of the level of care. It's the best. It was definitely worth it. It was worth everything. Any questions for any comments or any experiences from our panelists before we close out and review tomorrow? Okay, so we'll just recap the program for tomorrow. I want to thank, first of all, thank everyone for joining us today. Thank all of our speakers for such a wonderful program and everyone that put the program together. Uh, tomorrow is another day of Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Week uh, 2022. And so tomorrow, Wednesday, May 18th, um, the program is 1 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Uh, West African time and 8 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And so our moderators will be Dr. Nathaniel Yusuro, Sherry Azawa, and Yvette Bunch. And the symposium is Managing Better Without Blood Transfusion, um, Managing Obstetric Hemorrhage Without Blood Transfusion, and Managing Neonatal Anemia Without Blood Transfusion. And then we'll have some industry presentations. So I want to thank you all, and I hope you have a wonderful day. And we will just play an additional video uh, for you uh, to enjoy, and we'll play Way in the Risk and Benefits of Blood Transfusion. Thank you all, and have a wonderful day. Excellent program, all. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Kevin. Well, I was really very pleased when I first heard that we were gonna have bloodless medicine and surgery here. It's clearly increased the quality of our transfusion service in the hospital by making it more complete. When we go to a patient here, and if that person as for religious reasons, for scientific reasons, for whatever reason, a preference not to receive blood, we now have a team of informed professionals who can deal with that. It's greatly improved the way that we can approach the community and say, come on in, we've got people who think the way you think. When I was trained, and that was back in the 50s and the 60s, we would transfuse at this level here. Someone came down to here, you had to be transfused. That number was probably, let's say, 10 grams per deciliter, 10. There's a person right in the hospital now, her hemoglobin is below six, and we're having a great difficulty matching her. Years ago, if she was at six, that's a lot less than 10, we probably would have felt compelled to transfuse her with blood that wasn't perfectly matched. I saw her last night, I saw her early this morning, she's fine. And I've learned to be comfortable with that, that you don't have to transfuse here. You can go down here, you can go down here. In fact, you can just not transfuse. You have to balance the seriousness of complications of a blood transfusion with the transitory benefit of raising the hemoglobin over a few days. When a complication from blood does happen, it's potentially pretty serious, a life-threatening complication or maybe a lifelong infection. You can't get a complication from a blood transfusion if you didn't get one. That is a very key part 
of this new focus. I'm relying on my older colleagues to uh, convey to my younger colleagues the reality of their experience of having given a unit of blood that caused, maybe it was HIV, maybe it was hepatitis C, and then questioning, did I really need to give Mrs. Smith that unit of blood that's caused her to have this complication? Uh, I've had open heart surgery, and uh, I was faced with, do I want to get someone else's blood if I don't really, really need it? And when it really came to me, do I want to get someone else's blood? Only unless I'm as white as my white lab coat would I want to get a transfusion. Only if I was in a life-threatening situation. None of us want to give a unit of blood that's not necessary because if it's not going to make things better and it could make things worse, that's not good medicine. So it's the drive to do the best medicine that's possible with the least amount of blood that's possible.